And I am excited to share God's word with you today. I say that, um, and today we end our series in Daniel. So I'm not just excited that, oh, we made it. We're, going, we're done with Daniel. Um, but because Daniel brings us to such an awesome conclusion. And so my sermon title this morning is The Marks of the Wise. The Marks with the Wise. And look to the right and to the left and look at all these wise people. Um, you may not feel like that today, but wisdom is to know Jesus Christ, is it not? Um, how many of you know we're a little short on wisdom on our own? It is to know Jesus Christ, but to also know His plan for the world. And the book of Daniel has unfolded God's plan before our eyes, literally walked us right up to the end of history and to the coming of Jesus Christ and on into eternity. So guess what? You folks actually know what's going on. And that is supposed to mark you out as wise. Um, I was watching a film. I'm not going to tell you the name of it. It's so lame. But uh, I was watching this, and it was really funny because the bad guy, it was a chase scene. You ever seen that? Good guy chased the bad guy. And the, the bad guy is the most athletically gifted dude you've ever met. He's diving out of windows. He's scaling construction you know, barriers. He, he, at one moment, he comes and there's like this 12 foot fence in front of him, and he does one of these jump ninja, jump to the side, jump to the side, jump to the side, flips over the top. And, and you're like, wow, that's really impressive. But what's hilarious is the good guy, who is not as athletic, is just walking behind him. And he comes to the very same gate that the guy leaps over and he looks at it, and then he opens the gate <laughs> and he steps through. And of course, the comedy is in like, okay, you know. But I, I, why I bring it up is because God has called you not to be the first guy. See, the first guy expends exorbitant amount of energy doing all sorts of this, that, and everything. And in the end, he loses. And the wise person is the one who simply understands the situation and is effective, is not running around, flipping, dancing, doing all these crazy things. They're just consistently moving forward in the truth, and because they move forward in the truth, they win. Well, guess what? How many of you know that you guys have been called to victory in Jesus Christ? And what God doesn't want is you running around like a chicken with your head cut off. And it's very easy to do that in our world, amen? And the last thing God wants us to be is the panicked church, but to be the effective church. In fact, what I want to talk to you will be out of Matthew 12. I want to show you these marks of the wise. God wants your life to land the blows, like Paul said, to be one that has impact powerfully. And the truth is, if you will apply what I think is in this, ver this chapter we're going to be looking at, God says he literally wants to make your life a beacon, a light. He wants your life to be one that shines for your spouse, for your kids, for your coworkers, for your friends, and dare I say, for your enemies. He wants your life to shine. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Now, I am going to try to summarize in a very short amount of period uh, two of the most exciting chapters in the Bible as far as their difficulty and, frankly, if you read through them, exhaustion. Because I'm going to summarize very quickly. You need to understand the context that we're in. I'm not preaching out of Daniel 10 and 11 today. We're going to go to 12. But I want to summarize what happens there. How do you follow Christ wisely in a broken world? Daniel receives from none other actually than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and one of the coolest pre-incarnate moments in the Old Testament. We call it a Christophany where Jesus shows up. But in the middle of this uh, 10 and 11, uh, some things come to the forefront. And here's the first thing that you see in chapter 10 is that you're made aware that guess what? Person who belongs to God, you are in a spiritual battle. How many of you know this? How many of you don't live like this all the time? 
The truth is, there is a massive spiritual battle going on. And in chapter 10, what happens is the reality of spiritual warfare is put on full display. Now, if you and I could have, like, uh, is it Elijah's servant in the Old Testament who has his eyes open? How many of you think we would have one of those woe moments? A guy by the name of Adrian Kuyper said this, if once the curtain were pulled back and the spiritual world behind it came into view, it would expose to our spiritual vision a struggle so intense, so convulsive, sweeping everything within its range, that the fiercest battle ever fought on earth would seem, by comparison, a mere game. The truth is, it's not here, it's what's up there. That's where the real conflict is in. And here's one of the biggest problems we have with walking wisely in this world, is we think that the biggest battle is this world. That, that the, the physical things that we see, like this is what the big issue is. Well, friends, you're not promised for this world. How many of you know you're promised for eternity? So how does that impact us? In this chapter, there's some incredible lessons. Again, I can't go through all of it this morning. How many of you know that spiritual warfare is engaged as far as our part in prayer? This whole thing happens because Daniel prays. He prays, and we learn some really cool things uh, that, that God answers and hears his prayer. Um, but in that prayer, Daniel wants to know what these prophecies mean, and God sends one of his angelic messengers to answer him. And right in the middle of that answering him, the prince of Persia, apparently a high-ranking fallen angel, a demon, we would say, how many of you are a little nervous now? Guess what? Your enemy is organized. And your enemy opposes the will of God and is able to shut down God's answer to you for 30 days. Now who's freaking out? Notice I didn't say anything about did God hear your prayer or is God sovereign, but there's a spiritual enemy. We'll get into it. What I want you to see is if you were to read this chapter, Daniel is not overwhelmed by the fact that there are demonic forces. That doesn't make him ill. That doesn't bring him to his knees. Do you know what brings Daniel to his knees? His encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the biggest, most intimidating thing about spiritual warfare is not your enemy, it's your God. And if you begin to believe that he has spiritual purposes and that our flesh, you know, our fight is not really against flesh and blood, some of you are like, oh, you know, you've got to fight the demonic war. No! It is you being pulled deeper into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and coming face to face with who he is. That's what literally leaves Daniel lying on the ground and an angel has to pick him up. I love what one man said, intimacy with God will always leave a mark. If you haven't been moved lately, what does it say about your intimacy with the Savior? Being drawn into relationship with Him, it changes us. That goes on here. We find out that a believer's prayer, did you know that your prayer is heard immediately by God? There's no lost in translation. Too many times we think that timing has to do with whether God heard us. How many of you know that your prayers are heard? Did you know that your prayers and the answers can be hindered? Did you know that? I, there it is. It's right in the Bible. It happens in this passage. Um, we find out that there is a constant wrestling match going on in heaven, and it's not who's stronger. It's just that there is a real war. And here's something else. So many of you think that like you're going to just conquer one time your enemy. Not until the end is our spiritual foe vanquished. So don't think, I overcame that sin and it's never a re No. Until we're with him, there's a battle. Amen? That's all going on. Here's the biggest lesson. If I boil down chapter 10, what we would find is this. We do not enter into spiritual warfare on the basis of strength. We enter into it in confidence with our relationship with Christ. You're not even in this battle as a factor at all. 
You're in this battle because Jesus took up residency in you. So many times we make this a personal issue of, am I strong enough? Am I, am I ready? Am I victorious? Let me answer, no. No. But how great is our God? Some trust in horses, others in chariots. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. So what do you know from Daniel? Right off the bat, there is a spiritual war going on, and it rages, and it rages throughout history. You know this. There's a reality of spiritual warfare. Second thing, there is a succession of sovereignty. Chapter 11, honestly, will put you to bed. It is hard to get through. Why? Because Daniel suddenly gets taken prophetically into a history lesson. And he gets taken all through the rise and the fall of the Medo-Persian and, and the Greek Empire. And then in that same chunk, this is verses 1 through 20 of chapter 11, then he, he hears the prophecies of, of all of the rulers of Egypt and of Syria. And if you're reading this, you're like, what in the world? Why is he talking about Egypt and Syria? Do you guys remember the sermon on the statue and the empires? Did we talk about Egypt and Syria at all? We didn't. Why are they in there? Because they're talking about Israel. This whole passage has to do with persecution and all of God's plan as it unfolds for Israel, His people. So he goes through this. What you find in this section is that God is sovereignly in charge of the timing and the succession of all of the empires that rise and fall throughout history. How many of you know that God knows who wins the election this year? How many of you know He planned it before eternity and time began? How many of you know He's numbered the days of the United States of America? See, the lesson you learn in this passage is that our God is in charge. Not sorta, not kinda, but every empire serves as His tool to move along His salvation agenda with His people, Israel, and His expansion of His bride, the church. That's what He's doing. You know what else you learn? You learn that there is always a sinful progression in history. You want to know what it is? Man's lust for power and autonomy that eventually destroys him. Every nation that has risen and fallen throughout history is on the same hamster wheel. And what's the, main, what's the current that flows through everything? Sin. So you have empires rise and they fall. Why do they rise? To obtain power and autonomy and dominion. Why do they fall? Because we fought over it, trying to keep power and dominion and everything. And so you know that that is what's going to go on in history. God is sovereign over all of that. He knows exactly when it comes, exactly when it goes. Chapter 11, the first half teaches you that. And then finally, the end of chapter 11 is when it gets really spicy. Because you find the rotten refiners. Who are these people? Well, I just would tell you for the sake of time, in chapter 11, from verse 21 to verse 35, almost all scholars believe that the person this section of Scripture is talking about is a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. About 150 years, you know, back from Christ in the history of Israel. He came on the scene and he persecuted Israel and he created abominations and he did all of these things and it lines up exactly. He is what we would call a prefigurement of the Antichrist who's going to come. He, 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 he represents all of the persecution and yuck that's going to happen to Israel. Here's the problem, is when you move past verse 35 and you get into verse 36 to the end of the chapter, all of a sudden, this dude, whoever they're talking about, is bigger and badder and not, he doesn't match up with Antiochus Epiphanes. This is someone different. And the person that this is, is it is a recording of the Antichrist that has been promised through all of this book of Daniel. The little horn who would come. The one who will come. And at the end of days, he will set his sights on the utter annihilation of the people of Israel. He will commit 
horrible sin in such a way that it is greater than anybody and any persecutor, any awful despot, dictator, anything. No one will compare to this one. And God reveals that in the flow of history, it is all heading because this final person is none other than Antichrist, the evilest person who will ever live because he will be fully indwelt by the person of Satan. You all still with me? Well, that was the introduction. Why do I tell you all that? Because God will use these persecutors to move along His story. And He's in charge of all of it. So I'm now talking to you wise ones. As much as that might have been a handful to hear, guess what? There's world history. You know exactly what's happening. You know that God is sovereign over all of it. And you know that persecution is going to grow. You know these things. There is no way that history deviates from this plan because it's God's plan. So you who now have that information, you can be what the rest of the world isn't wise. How many of you know the mantra of the world is better and better every day? What does the Christian know? From bad to... Because they understand sin. Does that mean we despair? Does that mean we give up, throw up our hands? No. Open your Bible to chapter 12. Because we live differently if we know these things. We live differently if we know these things. We're not running around freaking out. We know how the story ends. We've, we can read Revelation 19. And in Revelation 19, you can watch the Antichrist meet Jesus Christ face to face. And you can watch the shortest battle on record. Because he is nothing before the King of Kings. But, knowing that means we live differently. If you want to know what a wise believer is, they are somebody who lives differently in this world. How do we live differently? Uh, Verse 1, chapter 12. You and I, if Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, we live protected. We live protected. It's interesting. It says, now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands up, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since there even was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. When it says at that time, what's it talking about? It's talking about this period of time called the tribulation. The worst. If there is a worst, this is the worst. This is as bad as it will ever get. It's recorded in the book of Revelation. It's chapter 11. All these places. And it says that at the worst that it will ever be, we experience comforting protection. I don't believe... We won't get into it. I believe that the church is raptured before this, but I'm telling you what I believe is that there is a protection of God's people, and it's very clear here. How many of you have heard the name Michael before? Who's Michael? Is he just any angel? No, he's an archangel. You can go to Jude, verse 9, and you can read about Michael there. You can read about him throughout. But he is an archangel. If you go to Revelation 11, You can read about how he victoriously vanquished Satan and his demons. Put it this way, Michael is not someone you mess with. And what I love is he's on our side. Amen? He's not Jesus, but he is a minister of Jesus. He has a special relationship with Israel. And by the way, when it refers to Israel as holy ones, guess who else are called holy ones? Us. So this is someone who stands for the protection of God's people. And we realize that there is this spiritual battle, but that Israel at that time, when it is bad as it will be, when everything looks like it's lost, it says Michael will arise. And basically, you know, that when he stands up, everybody else sits down. Because no one can thwart him. He is, he's God's, at, you know, and, and so that's what happens. But here's what I love. How many of you know that Michael's not the only one standing up for God's people? How many of you know that if you belong to Jesus Christ, there are ministering angels who stand guard over your life? 
you doubt me, you can read Hebrews 1, 14. There it's very clear that they are sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation. Now this is what I want you to think of though. So many of us grew up with this sort of Sunday school not that that's bad, idea of what a guardian angel is. How many of you guys remember the movement, men's movement, promise keepers? Okay, angels are the original promise keepers. What does that mean? They defend God's promises that He has made to us. And the promise God made to us is salvation. Amen? How many of you know God did not promise that you would get to home, home safely today? And yet we talk about, oh my guardian angel, He kept me from that traffic accident. Maybe. That was God's will. But you know what He really keeps you from? Despair that tells you that somehow God has failed and He will not do what He said to do. How many of you know the biggest promises of God have to do with your transformation into the image of Jesus Christ? You want a crazy promise? I mean, it's you. You know it's you. You know how bad you are. How bad I am. And God said, He who began a good work in Duncan will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. How's that for a promise? How many of you know the greatest thing that ever happens to you is when you look more like your Savior? And joy, and guess what? There are angelic armies who stand against the demonic opposition of salvation in our life. They cannot stop us from being saved. They cannot keep us from the promises of God. And God has a whole enforcement league that does it. How many of you just like that? I love it. How many of you would just like to see it, just for a second? Would it change your day? Some of you are going into some rough spots this week. How'd you like to see, you know? I don't know. Anytime you start doing what I do, which is imagining it, I could be totally wrong. But dude, you should see my angel. (laughs) He's a stud. Yeah. He's like, you don't mess. And, And why do I even think that? Because it's comforting. There are spiritual protection for God's people. And as bad as what he says will happen, he says you'll go through the fire, you're going to go through persecution. We will never go without the insurance of God's promises. But can I tell you, as much as I'm happy about angels, that's not the chief comfort. There is a count on it protection. There is an absolute assurance. Did you guys catch it at the end of verse 1? And at that time, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. How many of you know what book this is talking about? The Lamb's Book of Life. Someone was phoning in to agree with me. Yes, (laughs) that's the book. And now I will use a little bit of sanctified imagination. Would you close your eyes just for a second and listen to my words? There is a book and it sits in the throne room of eternity. And no created being can write in that book. It's God's book. Representative of His eternal will and love and power and might and majesty. It's His book. And all who He has called to salvation have their names written in it and on a page in that book written in the most precious substance in time and eternity the blood of Jesus Christ if you have trusted in him you will find your name and because your name is written there Nothing can take you out of the Father's hand. Your eternal salvation and glory and joy have been secured for nothing created can ever thwart it. No enemy can stand against your name is in the book. Now you can all say amen. That is the foundation of your strength today. If you peel it all back, why you have hope, why you stand strong, why you're not going around, running around crazy scared. I didn't write my name in the book. He wrote my name in the book. You didn't write it there. Christ wrote it there. Amen? That's your hope. That is count on it protection. 
This has to hold us. This is what is foundationally behind Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? You're written in the book. You need to know that because you live protected, but guess where else you live? You live persecuted. Everybody say, yay! You live persecuted. You know what is promised Israel here? In uh, verses 1 and then down in verse 7, it's very clear. Right in the middle of verse 1, it says, and there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred. When you think about the history of Israel, can any of you just pop up in your mind some pretty bad times? It's not hard. They've been showcased throughout history. What happened to them in the Crusades, what happened to them in the Holocaust, what's happening to them today. And that happens because Satan hates God's people, right? Well, guess who else is God's people? Look around. We're the church. Satan doesn't like play games. He hates God's holy ones. If you are saved today, you're one of His holy ones. He hates the church. He wants to annihilate the church. Why? Because God promised He'd build it. Because God promised Israel He would bring them back and He would be his, their God and they would be His people. And for all of time and everything He's got, He's going to persecute it. This is talking about a time that is in the future that is so bad. But I'm telling you, what it tells us is so clearly, friends, it's not going to get better. I know this is like the depressing sermon. It's going to get worse. And eventually, someday, there's going to be the worst. How many of you know who Tim Hawkins is? Okay, if you don't, he's a Christian comedian. And if you have YouTube, you should look at this sometime. I want you to look up Tim Hawkins and the worst. And he talks about this moment where his, his daughter is going to go to the mall and she goes to the mall, and she's going to meet some friends, and her friends don't come. It's very sad. She comes home, she's very sad, and her mom hears about it. Her mom puts her arm around her, and she goes, Oh, honey, that's just the worst. And Tim Hawkins sits there and goes, Really? That, that's the worst? And so he goes into this whole routine where he's like, You know, when there's wars and famine and all this, he goes, But I'm telling you, when you go to the mall and your friends don't come, that's the worst. <laughs> it's just like, people, you are so tempted to take this momentary light affliction. And what you need to understand is that what you're going through is a tool from God. It is a refining Reality. Persecution is there because there's no other means by which history will go forward. Satan hates God. He will oppress God's people. The question is, is God not God because we go through hard times? Oh no, our God is so great that, you know, consider it all joy, my brethren, because the very thing Satan is trying to do, I'm going to take it and I'm going to give you more of me. I will give you myself. I will give you my relationship. I will give you my love, my joy, my hope. I will pour it out. As your enemy seeks to put you down, I will lift you up. How great is our God? Friends, I don't like to suffer. I don't know anybody who says, Yay! We are not the masochistic church of Jesus. But we understand what God is doing 2 Corinthians 4.9, we're persecuted but not forsaken. We're struck down but we're not destroyed. The truth is, the Bible makes it very clear, all who want to live a godly life will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. And here's the problem. If you have bought the Christianity that has run rampant somewhat in our cultural age, and it's this, come to Jesus and it, He'll make everything better. It's this idea that you sprinkle a little Jesus on your life, and then that's the goodness. Come to Jesus and get a big red target on your back. 
Because now He lives in you. And your spiritual enemy will want to take you down. And friends, I'm not here today to tell you things are better. I have no idea what's coming in your life this year. All I know is that the world has changed a bit, at least for us here today. You see, 30 years ago, even if you weren't a believer, if you were rightly affiliated with a church, it was a good thing. Do you know what today? If you want to be anything in the social stratosphere of our world, especially in this country, it is a very dangerous thing to have your name attached to Jesus Christ. In fact, we are the problem now. And guess what? That doesn't make the world worth any less worthwhile. Jesus died for it. But do you understand? Persecution is arising. I don't know what it will cost us to follow Jesus here. I don't know what culture might take, but I know it will be such a sad thing if we are sitting in the room going, No! They took our tax-exempt status! What an evil world! Or we get real, I just lost my job because I couldn't rightly use pronouns. Or my friend isn't comfortable around me anymore because I didn't fully embrace their choice of identity. My desire is not for the restoration of 1940s America. I want Jesus Christ to rule and reign in the hearts of people who are going to hell without Him. What about you? I was at a really cool conference this weekend. It really challenged me to think about this, and I thought, you know what? This is our world. This is where we live. And I'm not a rock star. I don't have words that can calm them all down and assure our culture that we really do love you and we're not trying to be offensive. I do. But the gospel's offensive. It makes you bow your knee to Christ. And if we believe that Jesus is doing this persecuting work because He is refining us. He is refining us. So we understand the first thing is that, friends, we're not without protection. But that's not going to come politically. The president doesn't stand before me and he doesn't stand beside and he's not the God of any armies that can always be on my side. Can I reframe the words we sang? There's one. His name is Jesus. And I'm sorry, nobody stands up to him. Do you live like we have a God who's got us and he's doing stuff and he's growing his church? And you know what? He's not growing us in comfort. He's growing us in holiness. A lot of the problem is we're bargaining for things God never told us to go after. You know what we get? Can I just tell you what God's doing here? What's He producing? Are we just a, a really cool group of people who, because we've been forgiven, we're just a happy place where we can all get along even though we're messed up? That, doesn't that sound good? I just be so free and grace and stuff. And it's just all about me and all about belonging. And I love my life group. They're all so cool. And they love Jesus. And they put up with me. Oh, great glory. Stop. Every day, what we share what we grow in is a substance so awesome, so amazing, because it has nothing to do with fallen humanity. It can only exist in Jesus Christ. You know what it is? It's righteousness. And it doesn't mean we all walk in with our halos on. It means that more and more every day through the up, through the down, through the hard, the sideways, this way and that, we get more of Jesus Christ. We get more of His character, His freedom, His joy. And, and every day we, we wake up and we're like, man, I've got so far to go. And yeah, high five the person next to you. We're in a good place. You and me, got a long way to go. But guess what? We've got a great God. Let's go. Let's, let's pray. Let's get, get real in our relationships. 
You guys with me? Uh, it's hard because we never get down to brass tacks. Daniel is bringing us to the very end of time and he's saying, look, you're protected. It's going to get worse. Persecution's real. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you live promised. Not first. Thirdly, look at verse 2. You're like, he's only in verse 2. We'll never make it. We're going to make it. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about the resurrection of the dead. How many of you live today knowing that someday in a redeemed body you will stand before your Savior? This is the promise of all promises. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Job had this hope. David had this hope. Moses had this hope. Duncan has this hope. Do you have this hope? Because it's a promise. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and will be changed. To Daniel, in the midst of all this persecution, don't you think the biggest threat we have in life is death? Americans are terrified of death. We live like we're never going to die. We just Botox our face and push it back up. I heard some commentator go, well, you know, I'm 82, and I was like, She looks like she's 60. I'm like, how much did that cost? <laughs> Holy mackerel. I was shocked. I was literally like shocked. I'm like, they live like they just, just go on. Do you know? That's why we're so shocked when celebrities die. They've been preserved and all of a sudden they're dead. Well, why? They were 94. What? <laughs> they looked like they were 70. Guess what? If you and I, if Christ does not return, you and I will die. Could be sooner than you think. And if your faith is in Jesus Christ, and maybe you die because of some of the broken things of this world, you know what the hope is? How many of you know instantaneously you'll be with Jesus? To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. It's never a question. But what happens to the body, the full picture? What Jesus is promising is that at the end, He will resurrect us. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And the people here that He's talking about are obviously Israel. He's talking about that remnant that has believed in Him throughout time. In this passage, when they die, obviously they're with Him because Jesus is the source of their salvation just as much as He is ours. And He is talking about at that moment, all those who died in hope of Me will live again. They'll be there. And for everyone of us who's not even Jewish, but our faith is in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Bible is so clear. We will be raised in newness of life. Is that good news? Now let me give you some clarifying news. We live promised. We have a resurrected hope, but there's also resurrection help. Church, everyone who has ever lived will be raised. The resurrection is not just for those who believe in Jesus. Every one of those bodies ever lived or died will be raised. The question is, to what? Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, what is clear here is we will be raised gloriously as a testimony to the grace of God and we will be like Him. We will be changed. But the person who has not put their faith in Jesus Christ will be raised to be everlasting scorn and shame. You say, I don't know if I like that. I'm sorry. If you can diminish the person of Jesus Christ, you can convince me of annihilation theory that bad people just stop existing. But just as we are only raised eternally because Christ is eternal, the judgment is eternal because of the worth of Jesus. You follow me? You know what that should do? Every person we see is heading for eternity. And they will either be glorious or they will be scornful. When this hit me this week, 
it punched me so hard in the stomach because I think of how many people I walk by and they are only a means to my end. They live and exist no more in my mind than convenience. They are a transaction to me and nothing more. I was so, literally, I came out of studying this and I went to Burger King because that's what I do when I'm convicted. I eat. No, I, I literally went, I just was like, I just need a chicken sandwich. Like, where's the So I, I buzz over here and I come up to the window, this is all in my head, and, uh, and there's a gal. And I, don't, I couldn't tell how old she was. She was Hispanic and uh, just really straightforward. Hey, can I take you? It's something, whatever. And all of a sudden, it just hits me. I'm like, that's an eternal soul. And I look at her, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Hi. She's like, oh, I'm good. So how's your day? She's like, oh, I'm, just, I'm almost done. I got to go home. I got three kids. And all of a sudden, she became a person. And I thanked her, and then I pulled forward to the next window, and she runs around to the next window and leans in front of the guy who's supposed to give me a meal. She's like, did you want ketchup? It was so sweet of her. So I went back again. It's been a great excuse for gluttony. Um, <laughs> I went back again later in the week, and I saw her. I said, hey, how are your kids? Oh my goodness, hey, how, you know, this is my week and everything. There's a soul over at Burger King, and I want her to know Jesus. Will you pray? I don't know her name yet. I'm hoping to get it this week. And all I can think is like, yes, that means I'm eating at Burger King. Pray for your pastor. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Evangelism and calories. Woo, let's go. Um, you know, when do they become eternal to you and me? We live like this doesn't... Guys, we're protected. We know the end. They don't know Him. They need Him. And is all life about is the convenience of my day? Because that won't stand in the persecution that's coming nor will it evangelize and reach out to people and see them as raising to life or raising to death. We live promised. That's a promise. The final thing, and it's the whole chunk of the sermon, uh, is would you look at verses 3 down through 3. I promise I'll wrap this up quickly, but I want you to see this. It's so good. Um, Daniel as he kind of brings us to the end of this whole passage. Um, I totally confused my notes. Uh, he sits there and I think all of that, being protected, knowing there's persecution, having the promises of God, means that our lives should be very pointed, very directed. We are not random Christians. You know, life isn't all about whatever. It's, it's about, okay, there should be some things in whatever context you live that are true. I'll go through these quickly. In verse 3, it's such a, a wonderful verse. It says, those who have both insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead, like those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. Literally, God wants to take you and illuminate you. He wants your light to just shine. How does it shine? Well, if you know you're protected, if you know there's persecution, you know the promises of God, what do you do that causes you to shine? Verse 2, you value the Word of God. I'll just summarize this real quick. You can read some of the things like, where do you get these points? Uh, Daniel is told this, but as for you, Daniel... Conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time when he will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Let me just summarize that real quick. When he says seal up the book, he's not saying shut the book away. You know what he's saying? Preserve the book. Know the truth. Anchor yourself in this word. Do not let anybody mess with the truth of what I've said. Can I tell you, in our desire to have comfort-laden lives, we are attacking our own theology these days. We are on a war path to make it easier to follow Christ. And what we don't realize is that we are chucking out all this about sin and judgment and anything. And it's all about us and identity and all this. We're losing all of these things. Friends, our job as a church, not as jerks in this world, 
But as allegiant people and followers of Christ, we believe this is the Word of God. We will not get rid of a passage because it makes us uncomfortable. We will seek to get under it and hold to that truth. You want to know what you do, parent, in this day and age? You should pull your kid aside regularly, take your Bible and go, this is truth. And the world is going to tell you it's not. But you need to know your dad, your mom, could not survive a nanosecond apart from the truth of God's Word. I don't get to make the rules. He does. And let him know you believe it. Because that will hold them throughout their life. And, and this whole point is, he's saying, Daniel, I know some of this truth is confusing you. How many of you have been confused by some of the things I've preached the last few weeks? You can testify. I'm confused. I'm like, what does this mean? You know what he's saying? In the end times, people are going to run around. And you know what? Just like, uh, do you know the Jews could not conceive of Isaiah 53, meaning that their Messiah would die on a cross? But we can now, historically, can't we? Makes perfect sense. Guess what? How many of you think people who are alive in the tribulation are going to understand what this means a little better than we do some way? But you know what? It better be there for them to understand. Our job, we're not in the tribulation yet, is to hold fast to the word of truth. Hold on to the word. That's one. Second, Value his word, trust his timing. In verses 5 through 9, this is where there's no way for me to end and us eat chili today. What you have in verses 5 through 9 is one of the most beautiful Christophanies in the Old Testament. There's a man who stands above the river. And there's an angel on one side and there's an angel on the other and he's dressed in linen and he has everything of the prophetic revelation of the pre-incarnate Son of God. This is Jesus before we knew him as Jesus. And he stands there and he's literally Daniel. And it's not even Daniel. The angels are confused. They're like, God, when's this going to happen? And, and, and Daniel's like, I don't understand. And right in the middle of it, he raises up his hands and he makes this vow. And it's so cool because he raises his right hand up and that basically signifies something that is in accordance. It's, it's solemn, like it can't be broken. But then he raises up his left hand. And he does what no one else can do. And he swears by the name of God in heaven. And he, and he tells him, Daniel, I'm going to tell you how all of this is going to end. And he says, I heard the man dressed in linen was above the waters. He raised up his right hand, his left horn to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever that it would be, here's that phrase you're all hoping I'm going to spend time in. I'm not. Time, times, and half a time. Very clearly three and a half years. And as soon as they finished shattering the power of the holy people, and all the events will be completed. Daniel says, as for me, he heard this, and he goes, I don't understand. So the Lord said, you know, what will be, I, Daniel's frustrated. Well, it's going to be the outcome of these events. Listen to what Jesus says, because I think Jesus wants to say this to you today. Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. You know what Jesus just said to Daniel and He said to us? Go on your way. Go serve Me. Because I've written the end and I win. You go follow Me. How many of you know that you can't wrap your hands around all of end times prophecy? Doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But don't get stuck there. The truth is God's saying, I've got this. I've got this, Daniel. You go your way. You trust me. How many of you know the hardest thing to trust Jesus with is timing? But if you've been promised in the midst of persecution and you know you're protected, how many of you know it's easier? That's the truth here. The final thing, uh, what do we do Look at verse 10. I think this is worth noting. What do you do in this world? If you don't know when the end's totally going to come, and we see that that's what the end's going to look like, but we're not quite there, pursue His holiness. Verse 10. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. This verse is literally telling you, 
God's program for His people is purification. Do you get that? Jesus said, I'm going to beautify and I'm going to sanctify my bride. What's He doing in your life right now? He's making you more like Him. What's He doing in His church? He's making us more like Him. You know what He wants us to do? Get with the program. What are you doing in your life group? We're working on being Christ followers. I want to look more like Jesus. What are you doing in your private life? Oh, joy, Lord, see if there be some wicked way in me. Lead me into life everlasting. Root it out, God. I don't want to be owned by sin that you died for. Set me free. I want to walk. I mean, I, we do. You want to know the most powerful evangelistic tool you will ever have in your life? Pursue righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his. Not because you're legalists, not so you can be holier than your neighbors. So that they can wonder what you have. Pursue righteousness. The world's going to keep getting more wicked. Doesn't mean we join them. Amen? Pursue righteousness. And then the final thing he says is endure to the end. Literally this phrase at the end, when he summarizes the whole thing, he talks about the middle of the tribulation. From the, that time, the regular sacrifice is abolished. And the abomination of desolation is set up. Literally, when the Antichrist does his worst, he says that section of time will be for 1,290 days. Three and a half years. But then he goes, how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. What? I truly wring my hands in frustration. I do not know what that means. Not to, I've got to guess. It's not even worth guessing. It's almost like at the end of time, God is shouting at His people and saying this, the just shall live by... doesn't mean there's not a good answer, and I could give you a 15. But what it means is, for us today, and as we stop and we're about to go and fellowship together, Daniel... Jesus himself says, I've got this. Your worst enemy can only give you more of me. Don't be afraid of persecution. Don't be a church, frankly, church that is throwing up its hands. By the way, how many of you know that doesn't mean we don't get days to be afraid? We have a great and gracious God. It's not our strength. It's a confidence that comes in him. But then what it does is all of the hope he's given us, all of the knowledge of what he's doing, and knowing that he is going to win in the end, lets us get with this program. Today, Lord, I want to know you more, and I want people to know you more. I have found in these last years, anyone will talk to me about COVID. Anyone will talk to me about politics. You think it would be divisive. Everybody's got an opinion. There's no shortage of things that they find exciting. And it's real interesting. But we need to be people who talk about Jesus. So I challenge you. In your jobs. Students in your school. and our walks of life. Do you know King Jesus? You can't say that. Oh, yes, you can. Because the God of angel armies is always by your side. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to pray, and I'm actually going to pray over the meal we're about to eat. You guys with me? Let's pray. Oh God, as we come to an end, and I know it's late and I went long, and you should never do that before food, but we needed to hear God today. You are in charge. And wisdom, wisdom is knowing what the program is and that it ends with your victory and our enemies are vanquished. And God, even in this day where persecution grows, we don't have to be afraid. Our job 
is to go our way, literally live our lives for you. Lord, the promise you make to Daniel at the end is that you will raise us up at the end. May God, every believer in here know that no matter what, we don't miss the finale. We will be with you, alive with you at the end. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.